the chair wishes to clarify a misstatement. The speaker's announced policy of January 6, 2009 does not permit the extension of a special order speech by unanimous consent. Under the speaker's announced policy, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Carter, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Gentleman is recognized for 60 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, to my hallmate, Mr. Kennedy, I, I, that, was a, that was a moving tribute and uh, well deserved. I'm glad we could yield the time. The, uh, the subject of this hour that we've been talking about now for, I believe, about 14 or 15 weeks is we're talking about the rule of law and how the rule of law must prevail is the glue that holds our society together. And when we start to, we start to ignore rules or ignore others' uh, laws, glad to do it, sir, then uh, we are ignoring what our founding fathers intended to rule us. You know, when we established this nation, we, uh, the people who established it came from a monarchy. And yet they felt that a much greater society would be a society which would pledge itself to the rules, not to the authority. And so they, they didn't want a king. They didn't want some powerful dictator. They wanted the rules to prevail in a nation. And that's, that's one of the secret parts of the society that was created that, that nobody conceived at its time, but it has developed the most important and the most powerful nation on the face of the earth that has ever existed. We cannot ignore that rule of law today. We cannot let personalities or concepts or attitudes change the fact that there are rules that you follow and you must follow those rules. And there are laws, both civil and criminal laws, that have to be, be upheld. We as a society have created those laws. They have governed us for, some, in some instances, since the beginning of the, of the Republic. And to waive or to ignore those laws, we do it at our peril. So tonight we're going to talk about some things and some legislation that addresses the issue of ignoring or not following certain laws are bending laws to fit. And we're gonna start off with my good friend, Roscoe Bartlett. Uh, I'm gonna yield to him uh, 10 minutes and uh, he's gonna to talk to us about a, a bill that he has, uh, HR 2743, the Car Dealer Equity Act, which in which he talks about the fact that he feels some laws, some, con some contract laws were either bent or ignored. I'll yield to my colleague. Thank you very much. Before talking about uh, this very interesting subject, I would like to spend just a few moments talking about why I think the rule of law is so important. You know, we're one person out of uh, 22 in the world, and we have a fourth of all of the good things in the world. And I ask myself, how come we're so darn fortunate that this one person out of 22 has a fourth of all the good things in the world. And I look around for people who are working, bending their back and sweating, and I'll tell you, I uh, don't see very many white faces, and I don't see an awful lot of black faces, I see Hispanics. So it's not hard work that's accountable for the fact that we're so lucky. And then I look at education and technical education. We live in a technical world today, but most of our bright young people are going into careers of uh, political science and law. This year, the Chinese will graduate seven times as many engineers as we graduate. And about half of our engineers are Chinese and Indian students. So it's not our commitment to uh, technical areas that makes us so fortunate. Just what is it that is so different about this country 
that we are so fortunate, this one person in 22, that has a fourth of all the good things in the world. Mr. Speaker, I think that it's our commitment to the uh, rule of law, and particularly our commitment to those laws that protect our civil liberties. You see, there is no constitution in the world, there is no Bill of Rights in the world, comes even close to ours, in having so many civil liberties that are so protected. And I think this established an environment, a milieu, in which creativity and entrepreneurship could flourish. And I think we put at risk who we are. And I think we put at risk this enormous privilege that we have, this one person out of 22 who has a fourth of all the good things in the world. If we in any way violate these very sacred rights which are given to us by God, which our constitution, our government is supposed to protect. So I'm very concerned about the rule of law because I'll tell you, if in one place you can rationalize that it's okay to violate the Constitution, what next? And I think that our civil liberties could come tumbling down, and I think with them our privileged status in the world today. Now the thing you asked me to talk about, and that is uh, this bill, uh, uh, 2743. Several months ago, I was mystified by something that was happening in our country. We were shutting down auto dealerships. I thought at first, well, gee, these are owned by the um, auto manufacturers and they're reducing their overhead, so this will benefit them. But then I learned that not a single auto dealership in this country is owned by the manufacturers. Every auto dealership is an independent dealership, hiring people, paying taxes, selling cars. And I looked at what they were doing. You know, almost everything we do in life there are winners and losers, positives and negatives. And in this case, I could see only losers. And I thought I must be missing something. And so we held a press conference out in Frederick, I think one of the first ones in the country. We had some of our biggest dealers there. Dark Cars was there, and uh, Tammy Darvis is up in, the, up in the gallery. Thank you for coming. And uh, Jack Fitzgerald was there, one of the biggest auto dealers in this area, and I asked them the question, what am I missing? I seem to see that everybody in this is a loser. Why in the heck would we do something where everybody loses? Clearly, the dealers that were put out of business lost, and clearly all the people that worked for them lost, and clearly all of those secondary jobs that were created by those people were lost. And I couldn't understand how the auto dealers could be benefited when there were fewer people selling their cars. It just made sense to me that the more people who are out there competing to sell your cars, the more cars you're going to sell and the better off you, you were. And I asked these dealers, what am I missing? I got to be missing something because Americans don't do really stupid things. And this appeared to me to be a really stupid thing where everybody lost. I couldn't see anybody who was winning in this. So I came back to the Congress and I asked my colleagues, who is the winner here? and from both sides of the aisle. And now this bill, I think, has 275 co-sponsors on this bill. From both sides of the aisle, they said, gee, we don't see any winners either. We really need to do something about this. We think that some fundamental laws were violated in this. And we think that this needs to be fixed. There is a website you can go to. It is a YouTube, www.youtube.com slash rejected dealers. And you're going to find more than 11,000 dealers that have logged on to that to tell you their story. Some very, very sad stories are told by these dealers. Enormous losses. So I'm very privileged to come here this evening to, to talk about this, because I think that in the violation of some of these very simple, obvious, common sense laws, that a great many people in our country have been hurt. And I want to thank you for committing this hour to talk about the rule of law, because I think the rule of law is so important. And I hope that Americans will collectively call their representative. I know you probably signed on to that bill, but now make it happen. Bring it to the floor, vote on it. You know, uh, petition the Senate so they vote on it. Let's get this thing fixed. It's really bad. It's really wrong. Everybody is lost. Americans just don't do that kind of thing. We got to fix it soon. Thank you for letting me have these few moments to talk about it. Well, thank you, uh, reclaiming my time. I uh, thank you, uh, Roscoe. That was 
you have hit on something. I, when that all happened to me, I, I just wondered, what happened to the law of contract? I mean, where did it go? Uh, when did our, our executive branch think it had the authority to just negate contracts and order people to, uh, through some threats that were made to settle a bankruptcy, uh, to lose dealerships that, you know, I talked to people in my district and, you know, the, the, it was not only did you lose your dealership, but your, your work product got handed to the people you've been competing with. Uh, just kind of free gratis. You get the win and I, and I get nothing. And uh, of course, I, this, I, hopefully uh, this will be resolved in the courts or, or something. I don't know what's gonna happen, but Roscoe's on the right road. We can do something about it here. Because the, it, if you can't contract, you don't have freedom. And especially freedom of commerce. If you can't make an arm's length contract with somebody and depend upon that and have it be enforceable in the courts of our country because the rule of contract is sacred, if you don't have that, which we've had for the history of our nation, then the rules of commerce come tumbling down. And we keep hearing people say, do we want to be a banana republic? And nothing against our poor banana republic neighbors, but that's what happens when you don't have the rule of law then you can't make a deal that can be enforced and people become, go more and more to the dark side in their trading, trading habits. And this is one of the issues that's, when we've got a world economy, we've got to, to deal with. We've got multiple subject matters and we're gonna start with one that's all over the front page. Roscoe's gonna fix the auto dealers and I'm on that bill and proud to be there. We've got a bill by Leader Boehner and Daryl Issa, defunding ACORN Act. And my friend Lynn Westmoreland from Georgia is here to join me, and my friend Mr. King from Iowa is here to join me, and we're gonna, we're gonna spend a little time, this, we got a bunch of things to talk about here today, but let's talk about ACORN. I think those videos that the American public have now seen were a shocking wake up when they'd already heard about all the ACORN violations, we'd already heard about this, and it didn't seem to be bothering anybody that there were all kinds of election law frauds, convictions, and so forth across the country. But then we saw advice being given to two people pretending to be uh, in the criminal activity, and you saw people that seemed to be encouraging child prostitution, the calling prostitution business, how to do your taxes, just like they weren't talking about criminal activity. And I think that shocked America into realizing that all this other was real. And that for cheating on elections and cheating on voter registration and so forth was just as criminal and just led to further more criminal activities. And now all of a sudden the folks at ACORN are all over the front page. So I'll yield to my friend, Mr. Westmoreland from Georgia and let him make a few comments on this. And you got a sign there. What you got, Lynn? Well, to the gentleman from Texas, my friend, thank you for yielding. But I did want to bring us up since we were talking about the rule of law. Um, Speaker Pelosi, um, after the 2006 election, made a comment. She said, this leadership team will create the most honest, most open and most ethical Congress in history. And to my friend from Texas, we, un we know that we've been here many nights talking about the Wrangell Rule, um, where um, uh, Chairman Wrangell uh, was found to not have paid his taxes and then had his accountant figure out what he felt like he did owe and send in without penalties and interest and, and other things. And so, and then uh, we had Secretary Geithner who he did not pay uh, his self-employment taxes and some other taxes uh, on more than one occasion. And this is something that the American people are wanting to know where this most honest, most ethical um, Congress, most open Congress is at. And I just wanted to, to kind of bring that up to remind uh, the people that we're not special in this body right here. We need to be operating under the rule of law 
and be under the same uh, consequences that uh, every American is under. But let's talk about ACORN and what uh, the bill that Leader Boehner and uh, uh, Ranking Member Isa has introduced. We might want to remember that last week the House voted about 345 to 79 uh, for an amendment to bar the federal fund funding of ACORN. But we need to go further than that. We need to pass a stand-alone bill. And that's what uh, this H.R. 3571 does, the Fund ACORN Act. Uh, no federal contract, grant, cooperative agreement, or any other form uh, of agreement may be awarded to or entered into with ACORN. No federal funds may be given to ACORN. No federal employee may promote ACORN. Includes ACORN state chapters, organizations with financial stakes in ACORN, and organizations that share directors' employees with ACORN. And, and Judge, uh, uh, my friend from Texas, I'm glad to announce that uh, the great governor of Georgia, the great state of Georgia, has canceled a contract that the state uh, had with ACORN. So people are starting to understand uh, that when you have an organization that not only these videos exposed, but even the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform found ACORN had committed a, a list of offenses, voter fraud, tax evasion, obstruction of justice, aiding and abetting embezzlement, investment fraud, use of taxpayer funding for partisan political activity, Department of Labor violations. You know, ACORN should not be allowed to get off with just an internal audit. They need to be looked at much deeper than that. An internal audit for ACORN is the same as asking Secretary Geithner to investigate Chairman Rangel. <laughs> and so we need to go further with that. ACORN has received hundreds of millions of dollars. We, have, we should be more responsible to the people of this country, the hardworking people of this country that pay their taxes, that we would want to give it away to organizations such as this. Right now, I'll be glad to yield to uh, our friend from, uh, well, I'll yield back the time to you, Judge, and then you can yield, but thank All you right. for giving me this time. I'll yield time now to my, my friend from Iowa, Mr. King. Well, I guess we'll talk about ACORN, and then we, in a minute we'll shift gears to something else. I, I thank the judge from Texas and the uh, general from Georgia for their leadership on, uh, on these issues. And you know, once a week at least, we see the judge from Texas down here uh, laying out the conscience of the Congress. And this ACORN issue is something that has burned within me for several years. Uh, I look back through some of the records, and I had introduced an amendment to unfund ACORN in 2007. Um, back then, we couldn't get any traction. And as much as been filled out on the, on the case of ACORN, as much as we learned about ACORN during the last presidential election, and I think it was very useful because that was a time that America started to pay attention, Mr. Speaker. And we remember that ACORN announced that they had, they had filed 1.3 million new voter registrations during the presidential election cycle in 2008. And um, now they're advertising that people should send them a check and help fund their operation to go down there and demonstrate against Sheriff Judge Arpaio, the, the tent city pink underwear Sheriff Arpaio. Um, I think that that is a persecution that's going on, but they're trying to raise money to do that. And in the mailing that they have, and it's an internet document, uh, they still claim that they registered 1.3 million uh, new voters. Well, the numbers are closer to 450,000 legitimate voter registrations, and ACORN has admitted to over 400,000 false or fraudulent voter registrations. Now, one is too many for me. And we've seen the hue and cry of somebody who was in 2000 driving to, to vote in Florida, and perhaps they were going to vote for Al Gore. And a mile and a half away, they went through a checkpoint to see if they were sober and had a driver's license, and they claimed that, claimed that to be voter intimidation. If one person lost their nerve and didn't want to go through the police checkpoint because they were drunk or didn't have a license, um, that was voter intimidation on the part of the folks that were on Al Gore's side back in the year 2000. ACORN? can produce over 400,000 false or fraudulent voter registrations, and America can't get up in arms until we see, see child prostitution promoted, 
in five ACORN offices across this city, in Baltimore, in Washington, D.C., in Brooklyn, in San Bernardino, and in San Diego, California, and more to come. And now they're under a lawsuit. The ACORN decides they're going to go out and punish people that have brought out the truth if they can and use the court to intimidate. Now, when ACORN makes a statement that, well, we only produced over 400,000 false or fraudulent voter registration forms, never fear, it was all in the exercise of trying to get somebody's good vote in there, but no bad votes came out of that, no fraud came from that. Oh, really? Um, they're being investigated. We used to say 12 states, then 14 states. Today it came out 20 states. Today the trial of ACORN started in the state of Nevada. ACORN as an entity has been indicted by the, by the prosecution in Nevada, and they have their chief organizer in Nevada is testifying against ACORN, saying, we, here's our pamphlet, here's our policy. We were paying commissions and paying a bounty for voter registrations. And additionally, it came out in the news that in Troy, New York, they have dozens of fraudulent votes that were cast on absentee ballot that were promoted by ACORN. Now, if there's anything that chisels away and cuts off the underpinnings of our Constitution, it's fraudulent election process. And when the American people lose their faith that we have a legitimate process, the result of that will be then nothing holds together. You can't expect the President, the United States Senate, the United States House, or any system of government to be consented to by the people if the people don't believe they've consented in an actual legitimate ballot. That is the Banana Republic measure, and there is no entity in America that has been more active or aggressive in the history of this country and undermining the underpinnings of our Constitution than ACORN, a criminal enterprise, and an entity in and of itself and many other enterprises than the fraudulent votes. But I think at that component of this, I'd yield back to the gentleman from Texas and just help tip him off. I have a little more to say about ACORN, hopefully a little later. Well, we've got a lot of things to talk about, but ACORN is now all over the front page. You're right about the trial that started in, in Nevada. And quite frankly, I see a, a very aggressive prosecutor was talking on television today, and that's going to be an interesting case. And we all watch it very closely because wrongdoing is being put before the American public. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how that comes out. But I'm going to shift gears now because our friend uh, Dr. Ron Paul has introduced a bill which has been talked about now for years. But I think now the American public is starting to say, we'd kind of like to know something about this. We've had as we've talked about before, more money spent since last summer supposedly saving the economy than just about has been spent in the history of the Republic. Certainly in a history before uh, 1930, uh, it clearly surpasses what was spent then. It's in the trillions of dollars now. And that the Federal Reserve, this mysterious thing that I would bet it, there's not one American in a hundred can tell you what the Federal Reserve, even close to what the Federal Reserve, Reserve System even does, where they come from, who sets them up. There's just very limited knowledge. You're not, unless you get to graduate school, you don't even get taught it in universities as to what the Federal Reserve does. And yet the Federal Reserve, as, as Congressman Paul points out, is in charge of administering and keeping track of these billions and now trillions of dollars that of money that we're going to have to pay back and our children and our grandchildren are going to have to pay back. And what Ch uh, Congressman Paul, Ron Paul, wants basically is that he'd like to see an audit of the Federal Reserve so that we can know just what these guys do. And so let's, I'm going to throw that out for discussion here, and, and uh, I recognize my friend from Georgia. Well, thank you for, for yielding the time, and I don't know if we're going to get back to ACORN, so I would just like to just, okay, we will get back to them, all right, then I'll, I'll say this for later. But let me just say that, you know, the Federal Reserve, um, think about this for a minute. Under the TARP program, the Federal Reserve got 700 billion dollars. We gave them 787 billion dollars in the Obama stimulus package. 
That's over, as you mentioned, that's over a trillion dollars. And Judge, a lot of people don't realize how much a trillion dollars is. If you took a trillion dollars and converted it into seconds, you know, a million seconds is 11 days, a billion seconds is 32 years, a trillion seconds is 32,000 years. Woo. 32,000 years is a trillion seconds. And so we've given them over a trillion dollars and they don't want to be audited. You know, I think that this is something that I hope that Chairman Frank, uh, I'm assuming it's going through financial services uh, on, a, on a hearing that they're going to have Friday, uh, 290 co-sponsors. You know, that's enough to, to pass a piece of legislation here under suspension. And so I certainly hope that the speaker and the Democratic leadership will once again kind of honor her statement here, uh, will create the most honest, most open, and most ethical Congress in history by letting us have a vote on auditing the Federal Reserve. The American public deserves the same independent audit accountability from the Fed that they expect from their local bank. You know, the feds are going out and auditing our local banks every day, uh, Judge, putting a lot of them out of business, putting them on notice that they need to change the way that they're doing business. If they're going to go out and audit our local banks, we certainly need to audit them to make sure that they're doing things by the rule of law and by the things that common sense and by the things that the American people expect them to do with their hard-earned taxpayer dollars. And with that, I'll yield back to the gentleman. And I'll yield now to my friend from Iowa, Mr. King. I thank the gentleman from Texas, and I was thinking about that description of what is, uh, what is big money and what is a trillion dollars, and how do you put that into a concept now? Um, some of us in the part of the country I come from, we think in terms of corn. <laughs> and so to put that in a perspective, uh, the state of Iowa, the lead state in corn production, is going to have a good crop this year. It's going to have the best average yield that we've ever had, probably a few less bushel than we have produced, though, in the past. And uh, we're going to raise about $10 billion worth of corn, maybe a little skosh less than that, but about $10 billion. Now, $10 billion, all the corn that Iowa raises is just the value of that $10 billion. We do that for, uh, we do that for 10 years, that's $100 billion. We well, do that for an entire century, that's a thousand billion, a trillion dollars. So a uh, hundred years of all the corn we can raise in Iowa is a trillion. A full century of all the corn that we can raise and what it's worth today or what it was worth when I figured this, the markets have gone down a little bit, that's a trillion. Now, to take care of Obama's deficit created by his budget this year, that's 9.7 trillion. So you can just think 970 years of all of the corn that Iowa could raise would, would and committed just to taking care of the deficit created by his budget would be just about right. And uh, if you want to look at the deficit that exists today and you add that to Obama's budget, that's over $20 trillion between the existing national debt and the debt created by President Obama's budget. So that would be all the corn that Iowa could raise at today's production and market values from the birth of Christ until today and you'd fall a little bit short. That's how much money the United States government owes as a result of this profligate spending that's going on. And uh, the Federal Reserve component of this, I am very happy to see there are 290 co-sponsors and Ron Paul's bill, H.R. 1207. I am among them and I'm confident that my colleagues on the floor are as well and that there's a hearing coming up on Friday to, uh, to dig into this. Uh, that is a step along the way. From my standpoint, I would be very happy to sign a discharge petition. I don't think that things move very quickly through this Congress when you have the most ethical Congress in history. history uh, I don't know how that can be defined that way, but there's a lot that doesn't happen around here. There's a lot of deliberation that doesn't take place around here, a lot of debate that doesn't take place. The rules are written in the Rules Committee up there in that tiny little old room that doesn't leave room even for our staff to come in. And we have to go up there and genuflect before the chair of the Rules Committee and ask them if we can bring an amendment down here to debate it on the floor of the House. And you know, they'll say yes if they think it embarrasses Republicans, and that's the only way they're going to say yes. The deliberate destruction of the greatest debate body in the history of the world here in the United States Congress has taken place because of the rules that have been ripped asunder by the Speaker of the House after 221 years. And the gentleman from Georgia has a sign, and I, this leadership team will create the most honest, most open, and most ethical Congress in history, Nancy Pelosi, November 16, 2006. 
I don't know how you say that, Georgia. Say what? Uh, this is the least deliberative body it has ever been. And the open rules process that we had for 221 years that allowed every member of Congress to force a debate and a vote on a subject matter of their choice within the appropriations process has been utterly suspended since 2007. The American people deserve better. We deserve, yes, a hearing on the, on the for H.R. 1207 on the Federal Reserve. We need to deserve also to have open debate and force votes so members have to go on record because the wisdom of America is processed through 435 congressional districts and we all have our networks out there. And if that debate is stifled here, if amendments are shut off by order of the speaker, then the wisdom of America is shut off by order of the speaker. This country cannot reach the next level of its destiny if it denies the wisdom of its people. And that is the wisdom of its people as processed through this Congress was how it was envisioned by the Founding Fathers. I yield back, gentlemen from Texas. Uh, to finish up this particular subject, let me just point out that the, what, what I think most people know that the, the, the Fed has as one of its things as it does, it, it uses interest rates to micromanage our economy. It prints money. And the more money in the, that it puts out there, the less value our dollar has. It has, it, has, it has effect on every part of our life. Now, if you've never contracted with the federal government, back in the 70s, I did a lot of work for people who built Section 8 housing projects. And let me tell you, because they, you're dealing with large numbers, this was what you'd hear, you had to be looked at, re-looked at, and re-looked at, which is the right thing, to make sure nobody's doing something wrong. When you're dealing with eight or $10 million, that, you know, they want, the government wants to look closely at how that money's being spent, or the subcontractors being paid, and so forth. Now, why do they do that? Because they know the nature of certain people is such that they can be wrongdoing. We're talking about trillions of dollars, and we ought to at least know a little bit that an audit would tell us about what's going on at the Fed. So that's Ron Paul's bill, and I'm gonna to go to another bill. Just, not really a bill, but just a comment. We've been talking about the Wrangell Rule. I've got a new one today. We're gonna to talk about Mr. Geithner again. Because he's, he's back in the news, because he's, he's, he says he's got the, this bank, UBS, over in Switzerland to open their secret vaults and let him know what's over there. And he's being very magnanimous to the people he thinks have been hiding funds overseas. And he's telling them that I know you, I've made a successful raid, I know who you are. Now if you step up and pay your taxes, we're only going to give a maximum of a 20% penalty for your failing to pay taxes. But, wait a minute. What about the Geithner gesture here? I mean, shouldn't, when he talks to these people, he, didn't pay, he owed 17230 no penalties. He owed another 25960 no penalties. He used bad child credits. He uh, filed additional taxes uh, with interest in infrastructure. He, he had a faulty retirement plan, an improper small business deduction, uh, and he was expending utility costs that went for personal use. All these things he was doing to no penalties. And he is now saying to our, to the people he says, this is, we call this the fox is watching the hen house, that he says they've cheated this government, and maybe they have. And you know where I come from, if they cheated the government and there's penalties that ought to be assessed, fine. Everybody ought to get penalties. When I've been late on paying my taxes, and I have, I filed not on April 15th before, I filed on August 15th before, I filed on October 15th before, and I paid my penalties, and I paid my interest, because that's what you're supposed to do. I think it's curious that this is the subject of Mr. Geithner's conversation when he has not. He, the boss of the IRS, has not been assessed any penalties. So I throw that out for a quick discussion. I think it's interesting. The Geithner rule ought to be that zero penalties on taxes paid back of unreported income. 
until Mr. Geithner pays his. So, uh, if the gentleman would yield for just a I second. I do. I yield to. Uh, so, we're going to have, uh, are we going to introduce a new legislation uh, called the Geithner Rule? We've well, got, we're working on it. We've got the <laughs> Wrangell Rule, and uh, I wonder how many people have, uh, 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 when they return their money to the IRS, said, I'm claiming the Wrangell Rule. The Geithner Rule is uh, uh, one that's definitely people should be concerned about. Today in my office, I had uh, two of my dear friends. Uh, I had a, a coach, Mike Pickett, came in who coached me in high school and uh, another uh, guy that I went to school with, Mike Sarr, that Coach Pickett coached. And they came in to talk to me just about some of the issues that we were facing up here. And one of the things that Coach Pickett said, he said, I'm mad as heck. He said, you know, they're cutting my Social Security. And they've got a plan to cut $500 billion out of the Medicare. He said, and we've got people in Congress that's not even paying their taxes. And, of course, he was talking about Chairman Rangel. Um, we didn't bring up uh, Secretary Geithner, but I'm sure that would have made him double mad. That would have made his blood pressure even worse that to think that the Secretary of the Treasury has got this kind of tax concerns. I go back to this, what Speaker Pelosi said. You've got to remember that the U.S. Senate approved this gentleman, confirmed him to be a member of the Cabinet. This is the thing, Judge, that the American people are tired of. And I had one lady tell me the other day at a, a, a town hall meeting, she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> And I think the American people as a whole are sick and tired of being sick and tired of seeing how people in politics in elected office feel that they're better than the average hardworking American person out there that's paying his taxes. Now, I've had penalties assess assessed on me before. I think that probably most Americans have had penalties and interest assessed to them uh, for some reason or another. This is unbelievable. In fact, you know, we should be above even the, the least bit of doubt of what we're doing. He should have paid the penalties anyway. If he had been late, he should have paid the penalties and the interest. So I think the American people, you know, for us bringing this out, many people may not know this, that when they hear this name on TV, they don't understand that he is the Secretary of the Treasury. He is somebody that is over IRS. And with these findings and the fact that he has not been able to, to have to pay some of the penalties and the interest that most Americans would have to pay if they were delinquent on their, their uh, taxes, and especially using uh, your child's time at an overnight camp in three different years um, surely he was made aware of that uh, in 2001, but he did again in 2004 and again in 2005. Surely somebody um, from the IRS must have told him in that four-year period that that was not a legal deduction or either he didn't file his taxes. So, Judge, I appreciate you bringing this back up, and I look uh, forward to being a co-sponsor uh, uh, as I was with the Wrangell Rule on, uh, on the Geithner Rule, and I'll yield back. Woman. Mr. to be heard on this, Mr. King. Thank you, gentleman from yield. Texas. I, I'd submit this idea. I'd, I'd rather call it the Geithner Corollary to the Wrangell Rule uh, <laughs> because it gets deeper. And when you think about how much deeper it gets, it doesn't quite show on this poster, and I'm reaching back and dusting off my memory, but it strikes me that the employment that Tim Geithner was involved in reimbursed him for the taxes that he was going to have to pay uh, for from income tax liability for the the payroll tax uh, of the uh, Social Security Medicare and Medicaid taxes for the several years that are listed there that the reports that I have read and I believe it will also include the Wall Street Journal report that Jim Geithner was written a check by his employer to be reimbursed in advance for the tax liability that he would incur, and he signed an agreement multiple years in a row that he understood that he had this tax liability. So not only did he not pay the taxes until the pressure was on, and they waived the penalty, which apparently they pre-applied the wrangle rule uh, with Tim Geithner, but 
he had actually profited by not paying his taxes because he had been reimbursed by his, by his employer in advance for the liabilities that you see on the poster that Judge Carter has put up. So this gets to be, uh, this is a bridge too far from my standpoint. If, somebody, if you have a tax liability and your employer is writing you a check to pay those taxes, you cash the check, put it in your kid's retirement fund. I'm going to presume that's what happens. That's any equity that we don't spend when we die. It goes into our kid's retirement fund. Uh, and then, so you profit from this and avoid the taxes. That's a, that's a double operation there. So I, I will. I'll label that the Geithner corollary to the Wrangle rule. And that would be if you're nominated for a high position of, of uh, let me say, confirmation position before the United States Senate and you find yourself you have a tax problem, if you are able to settle this issue out of court and do so without interest or penalty, um, he, he owed taxes and interest seventeen thousand two hundred and thirty, but they waived the penalty. So apparently, he paid the interest, not the penalty. That's right. From that language, I want to make sure that that is clear. And if you get that all done, and if uh, if America's patience and appetite will believe the idea that Tim Geithner is so smart that we can't get along without him, regardless of whether he could remember to pay his taxes and regardless of whether it was an ethical decision or not. But if we remember, America's appetite for that was completely satiated by the time Tom Daschle was appointed and his tax problem emerged. Then they, America said, enough. I can't tolerate any more of uh, these appointments uh, to, by the president that would be confirmed by the Senate that have people that have been avoiding taxes. And so now we have the lead tax writer in the United States Congress, Chairman Rangel, that has uh, stimulated a bill that's been introduced by Congressman Carter uh, the wrangle rule, precedent of any taxpayer admits their mistake and pays their back taxes, no penalty or interest should be assessed. Hmm. Especially if you're up for an appointed position that would be confirmed by the United States Senate. Especially if the America can be convinced that your skills are so valuable that out of 306 million people, there isn't a single soul that can match up to the job that you might do regardless of the problem you might have of being paid in advance to pay your taxes, cash in the check, put it into the equity account for your kid's inheritance, and uh, then uh, along comes the old what woe from Georgia that is, uh, <laughs> I guess I better pay my taxes, uh, Geithner Corollary, and I yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Uh, reclaiming my time. It's kind of interesting that back to our other subjects talking about holding the Federal Reserve accountable. One of the suggestions was that the, that the Secretary of Treasury, Tim Geithner, be able to review the books of the Fed. And probably the smartest thing the Fed said was, no, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> and man, maybe there's something to that. That may be the smartest thing the Fed's done in a long time. We've got another issue that's been an issue for many of us. And Greg Walden and John Culberson and Brian Baird have introduced the bill 554, House Res 554, and they're asking 72 hours, they eat, that each bill have 72 hours before you take action. And we all, this is not hard for us, we know what they're talking about, because we have seen in this Congress, bill after bill after bill, spending billions and billions and billions of dollars that we get in the middle of the night to vote on the next day. And all they're saying is, let's do what, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the rules that this body still follows, he said they need three days before voting. That's in from Thomas Jefferson's rules, which he wrote for this house, and they're basically the same rules we follow now with some changes that have been made. <coughs> and all they're asking to do is, let's do what Jefferson said we ought to do in this house, and what they did in this house for a century, let's do it. Yield to, to Mr. Westmoreland. Well, I, I thank you, and in, in, in my congratulations go to uh, Mr. Baird uh, and to, to the chair. Uh, Mr. Minnick for pushing this uh, along with Greg Walton and uh, the gentleman from Oregon and a gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Culberson. And let's, in, in full disclosure, uh, my friend from Texas and I, in full disclosure, uh, when the Republicans were in charge, we did the same thing. We rushed things through. And uh, uh, 
Mr. Baird, the gentleman from Washington, uh, I think has had this 72 hour resolution in before um, and uh, when we were in charge. And so my hat's off to him for um, continuing to do this. Um, I think he now has about 178 signatures that Mr. Walden, uh, who is, has a discharge petition, um, has got signatures. We need 218. So if anyone were watching this, if anyone were watching this, and if we could speak to them uh, from this floor, I would say make sure your congressperson uh, has signed this, because I think this is very important that not only the people voting on this have 72 hours to look at it, but the people that it's going to affect. I think sometimes we, we lose sight uh, in this body that when we pass a law, it doesn't just affect the, the members in this chamber, it affects all 300 million people in this country. And so we need to make sure that the people that are going to be affected by the legislation that we're passing has an opportunity to read it. Now, is everybody going to read it? I doubt it very seriously. Uh, are all the members of this body going to read it? I doubt it very seriously. But at least they can be held accountable and we can be held accountable for our votes and people saying, well, you had three days to read it. Don't tell me it was something that you were rushed through. They've got three days to read it. And so I, I, I commend uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Culberson. Uh, I, I, I commend Mr. Walton for trying to do the discharge petition. Uh, and I think we have about uh, five people from the minority party uh, that has signed that discharge petition. And I want to commend them because that's a courageous act on their part because, um, as we know from being in the majority at one time, leadership does not like you signing those discharge uh, petitions. But this is something that needs to be brought to the floor. This is something that I think the American people are entitled to have some accountability for their members of Congress. And so this goes back to that uh, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so we need to do this, and, and again, uh, I hope that this is something that we can get the discharge petition uh, through, or if not, that uh, Speaker Pelosi would just bring this bill to the floor uh, and, and let us vote on it. And with that, I'll yield back my time. Yield to my friend from Iowa. Thank the gentleman from Texas. Um, if this is going to be the, the most open and ethical Congress in history, this Congress has got to have an opportunity to uh, read the bills. The leadership team will create the most honest, most open, and most ethical Congress in history. Nancy Pelosi, November 16th, 2006. Um, I don't know that, I mean, in fact, I'll, I'll say this, that yes, there were bills that were hustled through this chamber when Republicans were in the majority, but I, I have never seen anything quite as egregious as the cap and trade bill that came through this House of Representatives. That bill was presented to the floor of the House, scheduled for debate, the following day, and at 3.09 a.m., a 316-page amendment. A.M. Did Not, I say a.m.? No, you said p.m. I'm sorry. I meant to say 3.09 a.m. A.m. I appreciate that correction. I must have had some, um, <laughs> some kind of chronological dyslexia in order to come up with such a thing. However, 3.09 a.m., 316-page amendment, and... I can say with great confidence that no one read the bill, and I don't have to ask anybody in this chamber if they read the bill. I know no one read the bill. I was here on the floor engaging in the debate when Congressman Gomert from Texas asked a parliamentary inquiry, and he said, Madam Speaker, is there a copy of the enrolled bill in the well? Well, the answer was kind of maybe sort of. <laughs> And uh, we looked at the kind of maybe sort of stack of paper that was there, and there was a basic bill of around 1,100 pages, but the kind of maybe sort of didn't include the 316-page amendment. And uh, so after a few more inquiries, they pointed to another stack of paperwork, and um, Congressman Gomer went down and to look at that paperwork, and he came back, and uh, he said, Madam Speaker, parliamentary inquiry, that is not even the amendment. It was a different stack of paper. And so after 35 minutes of turning this thing around, the most significant question was again asked, 
by Louis Gomer to Texas when, and there were a lot of dialogue going on, Joe Barton. The Texans were engaged in this thing. I, I give them that. And, and uh, anyway, Louis Gomer asked the question that after about 35 minutes of suspension of the debate on the cap and trade bill, he said, Madam Speaker, parliamentary inquiry. If the House of Representatives passes a bill that doesn't exist, is it possible to message a bill that doesn't exist to the United States Senate? <laughs> well, today we know it must be possible because we passed cap and trade, a bill that didn't exist, and it got messaged to the Senate, and I think it probably began to exist sometime after it was messaged to the Senate. It's an appalling thing that the American people would have to watch, and Thomas Jefferson, it has to be rolling over two or three times. He spoke about a lot of things, 72 uh, hours, three days to read the bill. I also uh, um, put out a, a great big pat on the back for Congressman Brian Baird for leading on this, as well as Greg Walden and John Culberson. And I have signed the discharge petition and the bill, and I'm looking for the rest of the signatures on that discharge petition so it can come to this floor. That is something, a piece of bipartisanship that this Congress can pass that will leave a legacy for a long time to come. And, you know, if we're so afraid of the legislation that might get passed that we can't give anybody an opportunity to read it, and we wonder why people go to tea parties in America, well, that's why. Uh, they're really uneasy about what they've seen. $700 billion in TARP, eight large national corporations, private sector corporations, nationalized, along with then a $787 billion stimulus package rushed through this Congress. It had to happen right now and sat on the president's desk for five days before he signed it, and still most of it is not spent. And with that, uh, they watched cap and trade move through here in a hurry-up rush job when not one soul on, in this Congress or across this country read the bill before it passed. And then they see a hurry-up rush for a, a National Health Care Act that takes away our freedom. No wonder we have tea parties. No wonder the American people come out. It's just a wonder that they could be so peaceful and we ended, ended up with almost uh, no, uh, let me say, almost no violence of any kind in all the tea parties that we had. Respectful people that exercise their right to freedom of speech an assembly and a right for redress, redress of their grievances, and they did so in the traditional fashion envisioned by Thomas Jefferson himself. And so many generations have taken place since Thomas Jefferson, but uh, his wisdom remains, and I am certainly support HRES 554. Encourage everyone, including the speaker, to sign that discharge petition. Let's get that thing out here on the floor and do the right thing for Democrats and Republicans, and I yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Reclaiming my time, uh, the previous discussion that took a little over an hour before we came to the floor, uh, uh, commending Senator Kennedy and his legacy, uh, it's, it seems to me that when we're talking about civility, which is one of the things they talked about, if we could get back to civility, I think the 72-hour rule would have something to do with that. Mr. Speaker, can I inquire as how much time we have left? Uh, nine minutes remaining. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, I want to go to one more thing, and then we're going to come back to, to talk about ACORN. We're the czar champions of the world. We got more czars than the Romanovs had in their entire history of their dynasty. And our friend Steve Scalise, who was going to be here tonight, but he got tied up and couldn't come. He's got a bill to sunset these czars. The, the czar is someone who heads a task force or council, is appointed by the president without the consent of the Senate, and ex accepted from the competitive service, and does not have an existing removal date. Appropriated funds can't be used to pay for salaries and expenses of task force or councils established by the president and headed by a czar. This is what he's trying to do. He's trying to put sunset on this czar policy because it seems to an awful lot of people in this country the term czar means absolute power and they've created these positions of absolute power without any oversight. Start with my friend from Georgia. I thank my friend from Texas for yielding and the czars is something that I've been getting a lot of questions about lately. Everywhere I've been in Georgia's third congressional district I'm starting to get questions about the czars. People are wondering who these uh, 34 or 35 czars are. And uh, we've already had one exposed to the extent that uh, he eventually resigned. 
uh, people are starting to understand more and more that these czars are being uh, appointed by the president with no confirmation uh, by the Senate. And they're beginning to say, hey, how is this happening? What's, what's going on here? Uh, how long are they going to serve? Uh, uh, you know, do they work directly for the president? Who are they accountable to? Uh, what if they uh, have some type of job that's under uh, uh, Mr. Napolitano or under Geithner or whatever? I mean, what, who do they report to? What's the deal? They report directly to the president. And so we need uh, really sunshine on all the appointments, but especially as uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, H.R. 3569, at least the sunset on all these czars. And so, um, uh, you know, this is something that the American people are very inquisitive about. I think that because of the number of these czars and because of some of the um, really communist views and really ultra left wing views that some of these czars have that are being exposed, uh, is just bringing more and more attention to it. And I think the American people want some accountability. I'll go back to the statement. You know, they're sick and tired of being sick and tired of more government being stacked on. We've got uh, a 10 percent unemployment uh, nationwide. We've got some areas with 15, 16, 17, 20 percent unemployment. The only jobs that's growing right now is in the federal government. That's the only thing that's growing. So. With that, Judge, I hope that uh, anybody that could be watching might encourage uh, their representative to look at H.R. 3569. With that, I yield back the balance. Well, we're just about to run out of time. Uh, well, we, had a, we had a surprise guest come from the back of the room. Would you like to tell us about the czars? Did we stimulate you? You sure did, Judge, and I want to thank you for bringing this up. And it's just not who these folks are that we don't know. It's, it's, it's what they step on. You know, uh, I look at this as sort of the, the, uh, the fourth or the stealth branch of government. You know, I, I came with, uh, I, th I know of all my colleagues here, certainly my freshmen, we, we came with a, knowing that we have a serious responsibility to fulfill on the different committees of jurisdiction that we're appointed to. And I, I bring down back just to one example of the car czar and what has happened to the auto industry in this country. And, and as I could tell, I expected when we had these issues that we have a committee, I believe it's called Energy and Commerce, that would, would have dealt with the issues surrounding that industry. And yet, and yet everything that has happened in the car industry of, uh, of, arbit of uh, firing a, an executive from a, a private organization to uh, taking over ownership of, of General Motors to uh, dictating winners and losers in terms of uh, the auto dealerships, all directed uh, under the leadership of, of, of a czar. Uh, frankly, I think that's, I know that that's the responsibility of Congress in order, and we have a responsibility to, to approach that uh, carefully and, and uh, judiciously and, and make those types of decisions. Uh, that's the Constitution provided us that, that, that authority and that responsibility. And, and uh, the czars are just stepping all over the Constitution. Well, reclaiming my time, thank you, because when we, we, we feel real good when we can call a colleague out of the dark. We're glad you're here. I we're just about to wrap up time, and I want, before we stop, I'm doing something different today. This is, we've been talking about an awful lot. This is probably the most we've talked about in a single hour. As soon as this is over with, as soon as I walk across the street to my office, where, if you go to www.house.gov slash Carter, we're going to have a live webcast for the next hour and a half where you can ask questions and make comments about what we've talked about here or anything else that's bothering you or that you're concerned about. I want to have it. So you can tell Congress what you think. So I've already started doing this. I enjoy it. I've already got 300 questions waiting right now. And so I'm going to... Uh, to advertise a little bit and welcome people to come to this this webcast. Uh, how much time we got left? One minute. Uh, one minute. One minute. Did you want a, you want a minute? Mm -hmm. no. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for participating. It's most important you remember the subject of this conversation, the rule of law that holds this society together. 
Never forget, we're all talking about rules and laws and how they seem to be stretched and violated, and we've got to get back to the rule of law governing this nation. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 6, 2009, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schock, is recognized for half 